we do have a mission and a vision, and that is that we support the transition to high performance building operations, energy efficiency, and within that are a vast array of technologies, building types, uh, strategies, educational strategies to teach people uh, to work in these environments. And so as we listen throughout the next few days about each, what each of us are doing and how we're approaching edu our educational mission, we'll see that there are many different ways of approaching it, slicing into it, from the whole gamut of construction to operations and energy efficiency, of course. Uh, we are working to develop industry support. Uh, we've made a lot of uh, great strides in that, as Pamela was mentioning. Uh, controls companies, uh, vendors, uh, we have a lot of advantages available to you um, for your own lab development efforts. And of course, we have an extensive set of web resources uh, regarding programs, curriculum, course design, all of that is available. And we want to continue to add to that library of materials and resources that are available on the web for your use. And of course, one of the most important things we're doing is highlighting the role of the technician in building operations because um, largely this function, the technician role is buried. Um, and it's buried in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, it's buried in, in the normal life of a building occupant. Um, and it's largely buried as a career option as well. We're gonna be talking a little bit later about marketing, program marketing how we position our programs, how we do outreach. There's a huge gap between the availability of jobs and career opportunities in this field versus our ability to attract students into our programs. And, and one of the themes that we're hearing across the country is marketing difficulties, especially as the economy recovers. This is a very challenging, demanding field to go into, as we know. Um, look around this room, look at the, the intelligence in this room, look at the capability in this room, the educational background, the industry background represented right in this room. And we know that this field is really an exciting, challenging field to go into. And yet it's very hard to transmit that and communicate that to younger students, to high school students, and even uh, incumbent workers. So we will be spending a little time talking about that this morning. We do have a, a focus on commercial buildings because um, we believe that a lot of excellent work has already been done on residential buildings. Uh, we have um, um, BPI certification, um, there, there's just an abscep. There's been a lot of very successful, effective work at the residential level. <clears throat> what hasn't been done is at the commercial level, and that's why BEST focuses here. And I would just point out that notion of the convergence of advanced technologies and energy efficiency goals in commercial building sector uh, makes this effort so important. Uh, community colleges, and I'll just read that one bullet, are uniquely positioned to provide critically needed technician education in building science, energy management, <coughs> building automation systems, and related fields. And that is the essence of why we're here and why the BEST Center exists. Um, we have really, really important work to do. And we're here to encourage you at your level, wherever you are, to do this work and help you do this work because it is vital. 
That last bullet, uh, engage all building stakeholders, building owners, managers, occupants. Um, that's a crucial part of what we're doing. And everything that we've learned about a high performance building is that it's not simply the technician, but it's also management and ownership and ultimately occupants that contribute to that process. <clears throat> so the best center has three broad goals. One is to uh, work with community colleges across the country and help them uh, with their educational goals and to uh, build their capacity uh, at the local level. The second broad goal is to engage industry stakeholders, both at the local level, but especially at the national level to support our efforts. And this is a challenging thing. Uh, one of the uh, issues that we've discovered is um, we can negotiate, for example, uh, licensing. Um, we have a tritium license here at Laney. What we discovered was that when that license, which was essentially purchased through a local contractor, when that license expired, uh, the local contractor no longer knew us, no longer worked with us, we ended up with a, with a contractor outside of Detroit who we were able to negotiate with. And now we've been able to make that <clears throat> uh, deal, in effect, available to everyone. Um, with Siemens, we've negotiated some very positive ag agreements with Siemens that you can all take advantage of. Yet, Siemens has local... Uh, local affiliates. And so ultimately, you still have to work with that local affiliate. Um, ALC, which is another company we've worked with, uh, they have channel partners at the local level. So this whole issue of licenses and BAS systems is very challenging. Um, one of the solutions that we're going to look at later is kind of a non-proprietary solution. Uh, so we're constantly thinking about this, how can we make it easier for you if you are either teaching BAS or you're bringing BAS into your curriculum because BAS is a central technology of the 21st century in buildings and critical for technicians to understand and be able to operate and use. Um, how can we make it easier for you? And it's, uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, set of issues. So we'll talk more about that later. And of course, we're also working on the STEM pipeline. Some of you have heard about the, the silver tsunami. We talked about it a year ago. A lot of people are retiring out of the industry and there really is no one coming behind them. Uh, we still have a huge disconnect with high schools, understanding what this field is, what this profession is. Um, so those are big challenges. We did uh, develop some videos that some of you are using to try to expose the field, and we'll continue to do that work as well. We'll find out from you, hopefully, how those are working. And we will discuss some other strategies that we've come up with to try to engage high school students. Uh, we are many, many different people, um, MATC, Georgia Piedmont, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Laney College, and all of you are all curriculum partners in the Best Center and all contributing to this greater uh, mission of improving all of our programs and courses uh, and offerings across the country. These are some of our key themes, building automation systems, high performance building operations, energy management, energy efficiency, lighting efficiency, system integration, uh, and zero net energy buildings. And we are going to have an opportunity to visit the zero net energy building. Uh, I've been on a lot of tours of buildings and it's great. You look at the building, isn't it wonderful? But what we're going to do is uh, be able to get into the 
behind the curtain on the operations side because that's where the rubber really meets the road. They have a great uh, uh, display, but we really want to know how that building is operating, what are the technical challenges to operating the ZNE building, uh, and that's what we're going to try to dive into after we uh, get the surface view of the systems that are there. So we'll be hearing hopefully some in-depth uh, discussion of that. We'll also be hearing from an individual who's done a study of something like 40 ZNE buildings, uh, many of them in California, but I think outside of California well as well. And you'll get copies of, of that study and looking at the progress of, of the ZNE uh, methodology and um, strategy and hopefully gaining new ideas about that. Some of our critical goals, we are now in year five of the Best Center. This is a no, no cost extension year. <clears throat> we had so much uh, savings uh, that we have that opportunity. Uh, again, we're supporting implementation of programs, stimulating industry partnerships, we are working on several national certifications, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes. Uh, those are early stage. It's very challenging to develop a national certification. What we want to do is, is create those as kind of um, opportunities for colleges across the country to shape their curriculum. Uh, and we'll discuss that a little bit more later. Uh, lab design and development, equipment acquisition, uh, and so forth. Um, track program implementation, document instructional labs. We're going to be seeing uh, a number of lab, uh, virtual lab tours. Uh, Jim Espinas uh, led that effort. Um, it's, we have... Uh, Lane Community College, um, um, DuPage, College of DuPage, um, Sac City, uh, and of course, uh, GPTC are featured in this first round of lab tours. And um, they're very interesting, very educational. Um, and our hope is that they will give you ideas for things you can do in your lab. Um, I mean, Bruce, you're great. I'm, I'm, but now I understand that uh, uh, Jim took you through multiple takes. It all looks so natural. And <laughs> so, <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are uh, um, trying to engage a new strategy for high school engagement. And we are working on securing continuation funding for the Best Center. Um, and we're, one of our exercises is, is seeking to address one of the issues that was raised, that we need to collect more information and data for NSF. Now, okay, and I've mentioned many of these things, um, web-based resources, uh, support for lab design, equipment acquisition and software licensing, grant development. We're hoping that more of you are, are going to um, write ATE grant proposals. It's a fantastic way, if you can get one, to develop your program through a project grant. Um, we're going to have a session a little later about that to share what we know about the process. Um, professional development, uh, access to on-site technical assistance, and participation in the National Technician Certification Initiatives that we're launching. So quick overview of the Institute, uh, group discussions, we're going to be talking about marketing, uh, we need to get information from you about Best Center impacts with a little more detail and clarity. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to do an ATE application. Um, 
will be reviewing these virtual lab tours. We're going to show them during the next couple of days. Um, a couple, I think, at lunch or dinner. I don't know. Breaks. Some of them are fairly short. Um, I think you'll enjoy them. Uh, but we've tried to squeeze them in during the course of the next few days. Uh, and of course, um, hands-on labs. We're going to be doing a number of hands-on labs. I can assure you that it's, and I think Brian can attest to this fact, uh, it's a lot easier to, to just uh, lecture uh, and, and get a speaker to talk about a topic. It's, it's much more difficult to design a successful lab. So we, uh, I, I hope these, these hands-on labs are going to go well. Uh, we did have uh, some issues, but we'll not talk about those. And I think they're going to—I think they're going to do really well. And they're—you'll enjoy uh, those hands-on labs. I uh, mentioned the ZNE building. Um, we'll be having some industry uh, experts talking about the application of BS technologies. And finally, we'll have a keynote address on extreme weather and climate change. Um, I don't know. Can you can you see that little thing in the brackets down there? You can all see that. Okay, it's something I'm gonna I'm gonna delete that later from the official record. But um, I think we're at a very interesting conjuncture to use some sort of 1960s term um, or intersection of, net, of policy. A lot of the policy, uh, important policies are taking place at state and local levels. California has taken a very aggressive stance about continuing to pursue uh, carbon reduction statewide. And in fact, we've had pretty good success. Uh, at the other extreme, I was just reading about the state of Wisconsin, where the state environmental agency purged all references to climate change from its website. Not represent all of Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we're at a very interesting intersection here, and why this is happening, you know, there there are economic forces, and in fact, wind energy nationally is less expensive than coal, and at Wyoming is rapidly shifting from being a coal producer to a wind energy producer, and that's just economic reality. You can't argue with it. Coal it ain't coming back. Uh, people are resisting coal transport to the West Coast um, from the state of Washington to Oakland. Oakland had a big fight over a big coal export port from Utah. And uh, ultimately, the city council voted it down. Otherwise, we'd be pushing coal through the port of Oakland. Uh, these are kind of local fights, local battles. State of Florida. State of Florida had a choice of uh, essentially voting for a, a statewide initiative that would have really killed solar power in Florida. Am I right? Uh, and the alternative was more coal burning by big utilities. Well, the voters, you know, solar won in Florida. So, you know, all of these things are happening. I, I think a lot of it has to do with that term stranded assets. And this whole notion of leave it in the ground. So when we talk about a carbon bank account, which we've talked about in the past, that means that trillions of dollars of carbon need to be left in the ground. Um, and, and those stranded assets are very, very big. It's trillions of trillions of dollars of assets. There's a big battle going on right now between ExxonMobil and the Rockefeller Foundation, which funded research on 
ExxonMobil's um, climate denial efforts going back 20 to 30 years when they first began to realize that uh, carbon, atmospheric carbon was heating the, uh, heating the planet. Um, it's very interesting what's going on, and I'm not going to take a political position here on it. Um, and then this whole denialism manifested in places mm -hmm. like Wisconsin, and then science. You know what? Is, what is what is this? Where is the science? And so, I think we're we're seeing almost a um, a clash of paradigms, if you will. One paradigm looking forward, one paradigm looking back, one looking towards survival, the other profits, perhaps. And that's really where we are. But but it's going to be very interesting to see how things unfold over the next few years or few weeks, actually. <laughs> uh, we're also going to be uh, doing action plans and presenting those action plans on, on Saturday. Uh, we may modify these a little bit, but uh, we'll be getting out that uh, description of what those action plans will look like to you very quickly. And I'm going to just skip through these. Well, I, I will dwell on this for just a moment. Um, again, this, this very, very dense slide, which some of you have seen before, simply emphasizes that a lot of the technologies that we're seeing in buildings have to be used and implemented by technicians in the field. And uh, that's how it was in the Industrial Revolution, and that's how it is today. So there isn't a book you can go to or a manual or... You know, technicians are actually solving problems in the real world, on the job, using these technologies and making them work or turning them off, as the case may be. Um, and, and this is a whole historic process that's occurring. Implementation is slow and difficult. Much new knowledge must be acquired through actual implementation and learning by doing. So let me just uh, go to this slide. Uh, this slide is uh, intended to represent that much of the new technology is already there. Yes, there are continue to be new advances, but much of it is already there. The issue is really the education of the technicians who are using the technology. And that's our challenge and why we're here today. It's that horizontal access. Oops, how did that get in there? Um, I'm not sure if this is draining the swamp or flooding the swamp. Um, anyway, that concludes our, our introduction this morning. <laughs>